Al Capone is the most iconic criminal in American history. He was incredibly successful and used bootlegging and murder to become one of the wealthiest gangsters ever. Capone was so good at getting away with it that in the end, the only thing the police could get him on was tax evasion. But just who exactly was Al Capone? On this episode of Intrigued Mind, we'll be taking a look at Chicago's most infamous mob boss. Al Capone is one of the most infamous criminals in history, but most people probably don't know too much about his real life. How did Capone go from being a New York street urchin to one of the most powerful men in Chicago? And just how hard was his downfall? If you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Alphonse Capone, better known as Al Capone, was an American gangster who dominated organized crime in the Chicago area from 1925 to 1931 and became the most famous mobster in American history. He had a couple of other nicknames besides Al. While working as a bouncer before his organized crime career took off, he was slashed with a knife by the brother of a woman he insulted. This earned him the nickname Scarface, a name which he hated. When Capone was photographed, he would try and hide the left side of his face where the knife scars were, and he would tell people that they were war wounds. His closest friends had another nickname for him, Snorky, which at the time was a word for someone who dressed sharp. Capone's parents moved from Naples, Italy to the United States in 1893. He had eight siblings and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He went to school until the sixth grade, but dropped out after punching a teacher. He had a variety of odd jobs, he worked as a clerk at a candy store and a pin boy at a bowling alley, which was a job that existed before they had those machines that would set the pins back up for you. He was also a member in two different kid gangs, the South Brooklyn Rippers and 40 Thieves Juniors. These were groups of delinquent kids that were known for vandalism and petty crime. They were common in New York in that era. This was before the internet, so kids had to find something to do all day after all. It was also around this time that Capone joined the James Street Boys Gang, they were a harder group that was run by Johnny Torrio, who had become a lifelong mentor to Capone. At the age of 16, Capone moved up to the Five Points Gang and worked as a bartender in a brothel for a mobster named Frankie Yale. Capone ended up in Chicago because he kept shooting people and causing problems for the gang. One night, he wasn't happy with how a neighborhood game of craps had turned out. He shot the winner and robbed him of the winnings. Capone was questioned by the police over this, but was let go because no one had actually witnessed the murder. He also brutally assaulted a member of the rival White Hand Gang and left him for dead. This was more serious. The White Hand leader swore that there would be retribution. Capone, his wife, and his kid were all sent out to Chicago to work for Torrio there. Torrio had moved to Chicago earlier to help run the giant brothel business there under crime boss Big Jim Colosimo. Soon after Capone arrived in Chicago, Colosimo was assassinated, probably by Capone himself, in order to make way for Torrio's rule. The brothels were profitable, but the money really started to come in after prohibition began and alcohol became illegal. People didn't stop drinking alcohol like the government wanted them to, they just couldn't buy it legally anymore. There was now a massive black market that the mob stepped in to take over, and they became very wealthy selling booze. Without prohibition, it's thought that the mob probably wouldn't have become as powerful as they did. Some have drawn parallels between this situation and the current one, in which the cartels exploit the fact that drugs are illegal to make billions of dollars. In 1924, Capone was responsible for the murder of Joe Howard, who he had killed because he'd assaulted one of Capone's friends. An aggressive prosecutor made a serious attempt to indict Capone and had a good case. However, the eyewitnesses were too scared of Capone to testify and ended up mysteriously losing their memory during the trial. Capone got off and later that same year had rival gang leader Dion O'Banion assassinated in a flower shop he owned. Torrio went to jail and when he got out, he retired and moved back to Italy. Capone took his place and became the number one crime boss of Chicago. He ran bootlegging, gambling, and prostitution rackets and expanded into new territories by shooting rival gang members who opposed him. His aggressive and violent business strategy got him into trouble again in 1926 when he had to go into hiding for three months after accidentally killing the prosecutor from his previous trial. The prosecutor was actually childhood friends with some bootleggers and had been walking down the street with them when Capone did a drive-by. The bootleggers were the targets and the prosecutor was just collateral damage. Capone knew it wasn't really a good idea to mess with the government. Capone somehow got away with it again, even though it was widely known that he had done it. The most notorious and deadly shooting that Capone ordered was a hit that became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Seven members of a rival gang led by Bugs Moran were machine gunned down in a garage in 1929. Capone did 10 months in prison in 1929, but it was for something completely unrelated. 
He was convicted of possessing a concealed handgun. It was all the cops could get on him at the time. At the height of his power, Al Capone had 600 employees working for him all over Chicago. While it isn't exactly known how much money he had, most estimates put his wealth somewhere around $100 million. That's a lot of money, but that's in 1920s dollars. Adjusted for inflation, it's nearly $1.5 billion. If he were alive today, he would still be one of the richest people in Chicago. Americans were fascinated by Capone. The stereotypical image of a gangster that you see today, of a fat guy in a pinstripe suit and a fedora smoking a cigar, is based on Capone. A movie even came out based on him in 1932 called Scarface, The Shame of a Nation. Capone was said to have been a fan of the film and allegedly had his own copy of it that he would use for private screenings. The movie Scarface with Al Pacino is loosely based on it. Eventually, the authorities figured out a way to charge Capone with some kind of crime. Because he was obviously extremely wealthy but had never filed a tax return, they charged him with tax evasion. Capone's lawyer accidentally made a serious admission to the court while trying to regularize Capone's tax position. He told the government the income that Capone was willing to pay tax on for different years. For instance, he admitted that Capone had made $100,000 in 1928 and 1929. This was a crucial mistake. This meant that without even needing an investigation, Capone had accidentally admitted to making an income that he had not paid tax on. Capone was officially charged in a secret grand jury so that he couldn't intimidate any of the jurors. He was indicted on 22 counts of income tax evasion and later on 5,000 different violations of the prohibition laws as well. That's not quite one violation per bottle of booze, but it's a lot. At the age of 33, Capone was sent to the Atlanta U.S. Penitentiary. This is when things started to become a lot less fun and a lot less gangster for Capone. He was diagnosed with both syphilis and gonorrhea, most likely as a result of sleeping with innumerable prostitutes. He also started to have withdrawal symptoms from his cocaine addiction, something that had also perforated his nasal septum. Capone was assigned a prison job where he stitched soles onto shoes for eight hours a day. He was said to be good at this job, but it's thought that he rapidly declined mentally because his letters became almost incoherent. Capone was transferred to Alcatraz, where he was stabbed with a pair of scissors by another inmate for refusing to take part in an inmate strike. Capone played banjo in the Alcatraz prison band, the Rock Islanders. In 1939, Capone was let out on parole after his wife appealed to the court on the grounds of his mental deterioration. Syphilis had mostly destroyed Capone's mind at that point, and he was clearly incapable of returning to a life of crime. When he got out, he was transferred to the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, but they refused to treat him. Instead, he went to Union Memorial Hospital. Capone was so grateful that he donated two Japanese weeping cherry trees to the building. Eventually, a very ill Capone moved into his mansion in Palm Island, Florida. In 1942, the mass production of penicillin started, and Capone was one of the first American patients to ever be treated for syphilis with the new drug. In 1946, a doctor examined Capone and concluded that he had the mind of a 12-year-old. He spent his final years in his Florida mansion with his wife and grandchildren. He died of cardiac arrest at the age of 48. At first, crime had paid. It had paid really well, in fact. Later, however, not so much. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.